In part 5 of my lecture on diagnostic accuracy, I'm going to be looking at how we deal with tests which have a variable outcome. Here, we have results which are not just dichotomous yes-no answers, but can be a, a range of answers. For example, they might be on an ordinal scale, where we define a test result as either definitely normal or probably normal, through not sure, to probably abnormal and definitely abnormal. That's a, a range of values without numbers but put into an ordinal scale that can be arranged in order. Or we might indeed have quantitative values, numbers on a continuous scale. So this is obviously more complicated than the simple yes-no answer that we've looked at so far. And here's an example of a test that falls into that category. I've called it the height test because we observe that patients with syndrome Y, whom we're calling men, tend to be taller than those without syndrome Y, who we're calling women. So if we look at a histogram of the number of patients um, against the height in centimetres, we see a distribution like the blue one for women and a different distribution, like the yellow one for men. And the men tend to have taller heights than the women, but there is quite a bit of overlap in the middle. So if we put in a test threshold at 170 centimetres, for example, and say that anyone taller than that threshold is a man and shorter than that threshold is a woman, then a positive test result means anything above 170 centimetres. So the true positives are the patients in the yellow curve who are greater than 170 centimetres and the false positives are the patients under the blue curve who are greater than 170 centimetres. A negative test result would be anyone who was shorter than 170 centimetres and the true negatives would be the women under the blue curve who are less than 170 centimetres and the false negatives would be the men under the yellow curve who are less than 170 centimetres. So tall men and short women are classified correctly but short men and tall women get incorrectly classified by the height test. So here is our table of results. If we set the test threshold at 170 centimetres out of our 100 patients who 50 of whom are men and 50 of whom are women, let's assume that we have 40 true positives, that is 40 men who are taller than 170 centimetres, and 40 true negatives, that is 40 women who are shorter than 170 centimetres, and 10 false positives, that is tall women, and 10 false negatives, that is short men. So if we work out the sensitivity and specificity for this hypothetical data, we find the sensitivity, as always, is going to be the true positives, 40, over the total in that column, 50, which is 80%. And the specificity is going to be the true negatives, 40, over the total in that column, which is 50, which again is 80%. So we have a good sensitivity and a good specificity. But now we have the possibility of changing the threshold. If we reduce the threshold from 170 to 165 centimetres, then we see that changes things quite a bit. We reduce the number of false negatives. We now only have three false negatives because we only have a small part of the yellow distribution tail underneath the threshold. But we have increased the number of false positives because we now have more women uh, in the blue distribution uh, that are above that threshold. So we have changed the uh, false negatives at the expense of the false positives and consequently we've changed the true positives and the true negatives as well because we still have to have a total of 50 men and 50 women. So the sensitivity is now true positives, which is 47 out of a total of 50, which is 94%. And the specificity is the true negatives, uh, 25 out of 50, which is 
so we've increased the sensitivity but reduced the specificity. Of course we can move the threshold the other way and take it to 175 centimeters which reduces the number of false positives down to 3 but increases the false negatives up to 20. So now we have a sensitivity of true positives uh, which is 30 over 50 which is 60 percent and a specificity from the true negatives which is 47 over 50 which is 94 percent so we've increased the specificity at the expense of reducing the sensitivity so you can see that by varying the threshold we can get a whole range of sensitivities and specificities in fact if we reduce the threshold all the way down to 150 centimeters we can get a hundred percent sensitivity all the men are taller than that so we pick them all out but unfortunately we have zero specificity because so are all the women and we've seen that with 165 centimeter threshold we get 94 percent sensitivity and 50 percent specificity for 170 centimeter threshold we have 80 percent sensitivity and 80 percent specificity for 175 centimeter threshold we have 60 percent sensitivity and 94 percent specificity and if we go all the way up to our 200 centimeter threshold we get absolutely no sensitivity uh, because no one is taller than that but we have 100 percent specificity so clearly increasing the threshold will increase the specificity but reduce the sensitivity so we have to choose a best compromise somewhere in the middle and the best compromise depends on exactly what we're looking for so we can plot a chart like this on the vertical axis we have the sensitivity going from 0 to 100 percent on the horizontal axis we will have the specificity going from 0 to 100 percent but traditionally this graph is plotted backwards if you like with 0 percent on the right and 100 percent on the left which is why sometimes it's labeled as one minus specificity with the scale going the other way each of the yellow dots represents one of the combinations of sensitivity and specificity that I've just shown you on the previous slide and I've marked the threshold that we use from 150 centimeter threshold which gives us 0% specificity and 100% sensitivity through a 170 centimeter threshold which gives us 80% specificity and 80% sensitivity up to a 200 centimeter threshold which gives us 100% specificity but 0% sensitivity so we could draw a curve through all those points and that curve is called the receiver operating characteristic or ROC curve and this is the ROC curve for our hypothetical height test what we would really like is a curve like this the red curve goes right up to 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity and that would be a perfect test of course no real test is quite as good as that but that's what we're trying to achieve on the other hand this blue curve represents a rather poor test it goes nowhere near the top corner it doesn't come near to achieving high sensitivity at the same time as high specificity and this is a rather interesting line the straight line going across a diagonal of the chart um, what sort of test does that represent it's certainly not a very good test it doesn't go anywhere near the corner and actually if you think about it this is what you would get with a random test where you purely guessed every time you were right half of the time purely by guesswork and you end up with a um, line that represents the diagonal on this ROC curve I suppose you might wonder what happens if you get a curve down here like the dashed line which is below the line for random scoring so this is not just a poor test it's not even just a random test it is actually positively dangerous it is worse than random it is getting things absolutely incorrect um, that's not perhaps quite as drastic as you might imagine because once you realize that you simply use the test and then take the opposite result and that would flip that test back to the other side of the line and turn it into a possible test 
but let's not hope we get tests like that in reality. We're trying to get one as close up to the top left hand corner as possible. Now, you may be wondering why on earth it's called a receiver operating characteristic. Well, it comes from the early radar receivers because in the Second World War, radar was used to detect the approaching German bombers and when they were detected, the British fighters were scrambled to intercept. Unfortunately, the signals were rather noisy with the primitive radar and it could easily be confused by flocks of birds. So you had to decide, is this signal big enough to be real German bombers or might it just be flocks of birds? So you didn't always get the decision right. If you have a low detection threshold and any little signal um, you said might be bombers, then you wouldn't miss any incoming bombers and so uh, the coastal cities will be kept safe from bombing, but you may wa might waste a lot of time uh, sending off British fighters to intercept merely flocks of birds. On the other hand, if you have a high detection threshold, you don't waste any time when sending off uh, fighters in, uh, unnecessarily, but unfortunately some bombers might get through, which is probably not a desirable. So you have to find some sort of compromise, and by plotting the ROC curve for each radar receiver, you could determine the curve, which is the receiver operating characteristic, and determine the best compromise, the point that got you closest to the corner of that curve. And that's where the name receiver operating characteristic comes from and it's still used in all sorts of diagnostic applications. So what we've learned is that sensitivity and specificity can be changed by altering the test threshold and that leads to this ROC curve. Increasing the sensitivity will lead to decreased specificity but it's difficult to obtain both good sensitivity and good specificity at the same time. So that's the end of the fifth part of this lecture on diagnostic accuracy.